The Andy Poland Show. We got to go after this with everything we got, thinking they're going to come with everything they got. I'll start off by saying I'm bored, I'm broke, and I'm back. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630 starts right now. Oh, we will get to the Celtics opening night blowout in the NBA Finals. We will deal with the ongoing Danny Hurley to the Lakers story. We will, of course, talk about the Caitlin Clark Show, which comes to town tonight. There's even a Intriguing name story involving the Arizona Coyotes, who are now moving to Utah, which may tie in locally. A lot of different things to talk about today. But this day should be recognized as maybe the most historic day in Washington sports history. Didn't involve the Super Bowl, obviously, this time of the year. It's too early for the World Series to be celebrated. But if you look at June 7th, June 7th is huge in the history of our town. First of all, uh, if you're younger, you think of June 7th as when the Capitals won the Stanley Cup, when they won at Vegas and then they brought the cup home and carried on. One of the greatest celebrations maybe in the history of sports, certainly in this town. It sure beat a parade or a rally at the Capitol or anything like that. What the Capitals did with the Cup for the entire week six years ago was remarkable. But if you're older, uh, you think of June 7th for something that will always be near and dear to my heart. The Washington Bullets winning their one and only championship. Unsell with control. It is about to end. Bobby Dandridge, he will be our most valuable player. Bobby Dandridge voted the CBS most valuable player here in the NBA championship series. And the celebration can begin in Washington. Dick Mata and Bernie Bickerstaff are embracing over there as the Washington Bullets jubilantly file off the floor. And the crowd here in Seattle, rather than booing, comes to its feet and gives both these teams a tremendous ovation. Freddie Brown and Wes Unseld shaking hands at midcourt. And it was the Washington Bullets prevailing 105 to 99, the final score. A young Brett Musburger, 46 years ago today, as the Bullets won their title, winning Game 7 on the road at Seattle. No team has done that except for the Cleveland Cavaliers in 2016 when they won at Golden State in Game 7. And, um, you know, look at the franchise since it's been pretty much nowhere they did make it back to the finals the following year lost to seattle in five and haven't come close to making the finals since but we think of that uh, old timers like us think of that day and and remember it so fondly there are a couple of other things that happened that day which have kind of been forgotten but are significant on that day and i guess they didn't have a news conference or anything like that i think they just put it out as a release but charlie taylor retired from the redskins at that time as the NFL's all-time leading receiver. He had 649 catches. (laughs) You kind of laugh at that now because that's like a third of what Jerry Rice retired with. But at the time, that was the record. He had caught more passes than any other receiver in history. He caught 79 of those passes for touchdowns, also scored 11 touchdowns rushing. He started out as a running back. Art Monk, who's had a Hall of Fame career, had more catches, obviously, but uh, only caught 65 touchdowns. So uh, Charlie's in the Hall of Fame, should be in the Hall of Fame, but I think he's not recognized for all he was. He, he probably is top five among all-time Redskin players, and he retired on this day in 1978, 46 years ago. And Cal Ripken pitched Aberdeen High School to the state championship on this day in 1978 so you can just you know kind of enhance that june 7th 78 with those other two items i think what most of us remember is what happened six years ago today as john walton called it eller for the draw and as the puck drops the words that dc fans have been waiting to hear since 1974 the washington capitals are the 2018 stanley cup champions It's not a dream. It's not a desert mirage. It's Lord Stanley, and he is coming to Washington. That's about all that was left of John Walton's voice on this day uh, six years ago. And again, 
happened on the road, bullets winning on the road, uh, but the celebration uh, happened here after the Capitals came back, and uh, that's, I think, what we remember most. Also, you know, a lot of people watch that outdoors on big screens. It was really a communal thing, and, you know, as they look to rebuild the commanders, uh, you've heard Josh Harris and Mitch Rail say this, that they look at this as a public trust and they know that the impact of a, a championship team on this area is huge, and the NFL is king. And uh, if if they could ever get back to that, uh, what that would mean for the area. Just think of how you felt six years ago. Six years ago isn't that long ago, realistically, but six years ago was before the pandemic. It was before the Nationals won their World Series. And there was just a different feel about things at that time, at least for me. And and now six years later, you look back and you go, well, you know, Capitals are rebuilding now. Ovechkin is still there. He's still chasing the record. But uh, what we felt when the Capitals won the Cup, I know a lot of people cry because they went through the pain and suffering of the early days, especially when they were an expansion team. I think they won eight games their first year, only one road game. And there were people who stuck with them thick and thin through the years. I remember going to the parade and they put some of the longtime season ticket holders up on one of the, uh, well, I guess it wasn't a float, but they were like buses that went by open, open air buses and cars and things like that. And it was, it was a monumental event, no pun intended, Ted. And then uh, when the Nats won a year later, that was also a great thing. That's one of the great <clears throat> thrills that I've had anyway in broadcasting was uh, we broadcast the parade live from on top of the roof of the National Museum of Art. I thought that was a really cool thing. So, you know, if, if there was a proclamation uh, to be made by the mayor for sports, I think you might designate June 7th as sort of a local holiday. I don't know if you get off from work, schools are, well, I guess kids are still in school, some kids. Uh, but I think that when you think of, of this day, and usually it's a, really good time of year for weather we're not quite into the swelter of summer it's it's just really nice to look back on events that happened on this day both 46 and six years ago all right from last night you know i uh i only watched the first half to be honest and i thought you know this will be a complete blowout it apparently wasn't um the dallas mavericks got to within eight in the second half but when boston was ready to step on the gas They stepped on the gas uh, after the run that Dallas had to get to within eight. They went on an 11-0 run and closed the game out. And if you look at the box score, the box score doesn't tell you everything. But often when a team is is winning, it's because the two superstars really, as they say, balled out. And they got good games from Tatum and Brown, the two stars. They had 38 points combined. Uh, Jason Tatum had 16 points and Jalen Brown had 22 But the difference in this game was one man and one man only. And what we saw from Christoph Porzingis is, you know, I guess there have been performances like this. You know, guys come back from injury, gals uh, to women, uh, and, and have this kind of thing. But I don't think anybody saw this coming. This is a close game. And Christoph Porzingis, who had not played in 38 days, comes into the game in a close game in the first quarter. And, well, if you're too young to have seen Bill Walton, this was like Walton with a jump shot. This was this was remarkable what he did. He had 18 of his 20 points for the game in that first half, but the accelerator that he hit in that, in that first quarter was incredible. And this was after the game, uh, J.J. Redick and Doris Burke, who called it along with Mike Breen, talking to Scott Van Pelt about what the Celtics were able to get from Porzingis, who, you know, played it all down going into the game. You know, it's a calf injury. I don't know how I'm going to respond. Who knew what kind of shape he was going to be in? He only played 20 minutes, but the minutes that he played in the first half were the difference in the game by far. So this was J.J. Redick and Doris Burke with Van Pelt on last night's victory for the Celtics as they win it 107-89. The Boston Celtics, particularly at home, we've seen them do this time and time again. They set records this year for the most wins by 25 or more, the most times leading by 20 or more within a game. This is what they do, and, and this is the math problem 
for the Dallas Mavericks. And it, there's a clear game plan from the Boston Celtics on the defensive side. Look, Kyrie and Luka Doncic, they're going to self-create. If you can take away corner threes and the lob dunk out of pick and roll, you're going to have a lot more success against this team trying to slow them down. DB, the, the avalanche on offense was one thing, and J.J. just alluded to the defense. And I, I, I think it becomes such a low-hanging fruit to talk about the experience and the familiarity with the stage. Do you buy that any of that plays into what Boston was able to do this evening in the Game 1 victory? I thought there were moments in the first quarter where a couple of the guys on Dallas who hadn't been in this level of a game yet in particular showed it. But I have to give one point about the Dallas defense, right? We have spent the latter part of this season going to their 16-4 and four sprint to the finish. And all throughout these playoffs, we've given them a ton of kudos about the defensive end of the floor, Scott. Yep. Boston has fought all year for their spacing. And I thought in the third quarter, Scott, right, when all of a sudden those threes weren't falling, Tatum and Brown refused to settle. And Dallas's inability to contain the ball, and this was a theme throughout the night, but in particular, when things got a little bit tighter in that third quarter, their ability to get by, first thing Dallas has to do to me is start to contain the ball as well because that's when it starts to pop around the floor, and that's when that avalanche sets in. Doris, I'll stay with you just for a thought on Porzingis. In his media session earlier in the week, he was a little coy, smiling about, you know, availability. And I think we all wondered. There was no minutes restriction, but I didn't, I frankly didn't know what to expect. Did you expect to see that kind of flurry of punches from Porzingis? Listen, J.J. and Legs can talk about this better than me. But to me, the thing that shocked me is that's a calf injury. That can be terribly frightening. And from the moment he stepped between the lines, he was sprinting for chase down blocks like he was so confident in his body. And that to me was the telltale sign that he was going to be able to be the force he was. The couple of threes he made from like 29 feet. Right. His impact has been critical on both ends. To me, he's unlocked so much, Scott. Uh, just what, And I just love the joy he plays with. The smile that's always on his face. It's fun to watch. JJ, I want to give you a final word. I love wherever you talk about basketball, pods here, wherever, about just the game and breaking things down. If you're Dallas, you know what the conversation will be. What adjustments do you make? Frankly, I think there are things that aren't adjustable too. I don't know if that's put very eloquently. I just want to know if you're Dallas, what do you do differently? <laughs> Look, I think where Boston has an advantage is that they can create mismatches defensively, whether it's Kyrie Irving, Luka Doncic. They have size against Josh Green when he comes off the bench. They don't want to put two on the ball. Sometimes they have to. Doris's point about Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum just putting their head down and driving the basketball and creating opportunities for their teammate in that third quarter, it changed the game. Yeah, it really did. And look, um, I, I hesitate to, to do what Barkley and some others did after Minnesota won those first two games in Denver. He, he declared it a sweep. It's over. Wound up going to seven. Minnesota did win, but it, it, it did go to seven games. So while this looks like it could be a sweep for Boston. You got to realize a, a few things. Uh, adjustments are always huge in these playoff series. Um, Luka Doncic is probably going to continue to score like he did last night. He scored 30 points. That's what you're going to get from him. You, you hope to get 30, and I think he will continue to get his points. But he's going to have games. He's got to have more than one assist. He's got to distribute the ball better. Uh, Kyrie Irving, really not much of a factor last night. Shot 6 of 19 from the field, finished with 12 points. He's going to give them more points. Um, the second half where it looked like, okay, Boston is going to win this game by 40 and Dallas has no interest in playing tonight, they actually outscored the Celtics in the second half. Not by much, but outscored them by a couple of points and, again, did cut it down to eight. So I, I hesitate to say it's over. Also, you know, maybe they were thinking that Porzingis might be a factor in this game. I don't think they were thinking he was going to be that kind of a factor. So there's probably going to be adjustments that are going to be made. Um, I, I really think that they're, they're going to have to have uh, some things that they look at. Uh, Daniel Gafford only played 14 minutes last night. You know, he's somebody uh, he has got the size to match up with Porzingis, maybe not the quickness. So I think that there'll be some adjustments made there. And the only other thing you, you think of, you know, is 
is are the two stars Brown and Tatum going to score more? And if they do, if they're each scoring, you know, well into the thirties for points, then you know it's probably over. But uh, for Dallas to stay up, they got to get a continued play like this from Doncic with more assists. One assist is, is inexcusable, uh, and Irving's got to play better than he did. Uh, and you know they've got to find out a, a way to control a player coming off the bench who who totally changed the game. He, he changed it both with his shooting. I mean, Dallas shoots. I'm, I'm sorry, Boston shoots threes. Forty two threes last night. Forty two, and they hit sixteen of them. Uh, a lot of the misses were in the second half. They, they they really took control of the game in that that second quarter as they were knocking down three after three and. To have uh, the ability of Porzingis to, to, at both ends of the court, the, the blocks that Doris Burke talked about, he had three of them, three blocks in 20 minutes. That's, that's saying something, that he can run the floor like that and create problems at both ends. That's going to be something that they're going to have to adjust to, but, but don't rule it out. So, well, it looks bad for Dallas, and it may be, and it looks like – you know, Boston certainly has a, a deeper team and a better team and more players who can beat them. We've seen things happen before. So I'm not going to write this off yet as, as an easy series win for Boston. And Boston, if you look at what they've done in the playoffs, uh, not the last round where they had a sweep of Indiana, but they've, you know, kind of let down in game two. So we got game two coming up on Sunday night. I would not be surprised if Dallas comes back and wins this game, and then they go to Dallas for game three, which will be Wednesday, where they really spread it out during the finals. So they're, they're playing, what, Thursday night, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Friday night, and then you go through Saturday and Sunday, and game five, if necessary, would be played on Monday, June 17th. So we're off and running in the NBA finals. Boston looks like the better team but Dallas didn't play that well at all last night and, uh, and still made it interesting in the second half. And I think, uh, I think we could be in for some uh, pretty good basketball over the next uh, maybe even two weeks. We'll see. Uh, coming up, uh, the continuing Danny Hurley story. Latest is he's supposed to meet with the Laker front office today in Los Angeles. Tony and Mike with thoughts on that. And Gino Oriema, who had, and where did you hear this, had a, a conversation with Hurley before the news broke, which might surprise you. Uh, we'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. The NBA Commissioner Adam Silver weighed in last night on the controversy around Caitlin Clark. Uh, Sally Jenkins has a very good column about that today. We'll, we'll get to that in about 20 minutes or so, uh, and we will get back to the NBA Finals much more at 10 o'clock about uh, the Celtics getting the early jump last night. The Danny Hurley story continues, and the latest is he's due in Southern California today to meet with Lakers Vice President of Basketball Operations Rob Palinka and owner Jeannie Buss as they are looking to make a deal, make a deal to uh, make him the next Laker coach. Long-term deal. Uh, they think his player development is going to be very helpful. Maybe it's you know to develop Bronny James into a great player. You know that could be part of the picture here because LeBron has put out things on social media that he's uh, he's very impressed by what Hurley has done. There's other angles to this as well, including you know what does it mean for college basketball that the coach of the two-time defending champs is going to pass up a three-peat opportunity to go to the NBA. Would that have happened years ago? Mike Krzyzewski turned down the Lakers 20 years ago. Similar age, just a, a few years older than Hurley, who's 51. But the landscape of college basketball 20 years later is a whole lot different. Pat Forty's got some thoughts on that, and, and I'll get to those in a minute. This is uh, Tony and Mike last night on PTI. And if you listen to Tony here, uh, he's not so sure this is a good idea for Hurley Whatever kind of money they are paying, whatever kind of escape he will have from the current state of college athletics, um, with his style, with his personality, with the fact that he's an East Coast guy, all those things go into it. Uh, this is Tony and Mike, their conversation last night about this story of uh, Hurley being pursued by the Lakers. Tone, does this seem like it would be a good move for Hurley and or a good move for the Lakers? So as you know, I'm up early in the morning and I watch the Sports Center live at seven in the morning. And I watched Adrian Wojnarowski get on there and talk about the fact that they had zeroed in 
on Danny Hurley. And I believe at one point he said the other interviews they've done were due process and due diligence, you know, and that this is the guy they wanted. They want to give him a lot of money and a lot of years. And I said, that's great for Danny Hurley because he's a great college coach. But my real first reaction was don't take the money. No, don't take the money. Because the history of the NBA shows us that college coaches who move into the NBA very often fail at this. And I can think of John Calipari, for example, right off the top. It was a disaster with the Nets as far as I was concerned. I I mean, Danny Hurley is a very frenetic coach. He yells and screams and runs up and down the sideline. I don't know, Mike, that NBA players really respond to that that well. I don't know that NBA players want to be coached as much as they want to be indulged. So I'm not sure that this thing is going to work out. I think players are going to look at him and think they're back in high school. Tony, I'm not sure it's going to work out either, but let me say this. First of all, the comps are Brad Stevens and Billy Donovan. Those are the comps. They did not fail at the pro level, all right? These are they guys who in Brad well, Stevens' Donovan, cases back-to-back in the Final Four. Billy Donovan won two, and he didn't fail at Oklahoma yeah. City. He didn't fail. He, no, he didn't win at all. He didn't fail. But he was in the finals. either. Right. He, he hasn't, he he hasn't made a big impact yet. In the One finals, time, he and was. Then he, then he, Mike, he lost. Not He wasn't in the finals finals. He was in the conference finals, right? And then his Con- next five conference, playoff conference series, conference I thought he Oklahoma lost. City, yes. Right. Yeah, but Tony, yeah. those guys, listen, first of all, the other thing that's changed is the, con- is the landscape of college sports. With NIL, you look at Jim Harbaugh, out, all right? Nick Saban, out. These aren't coincidences that right. you can point to Saban and say, well, he's older, is more retirement than it is resignation. And now yeah. maybe a coach with a two-time champion. Tony, with NIL, coaches don't want to do this. They don't have control. You talk about not having control in the in- NBA. They don't have control in college, and they hate that. These guys are control freaks. They can't even control who's in their building because of the transfer portal. They can't control who gets paid the most money because they don't determine that. And now you've got lawsuits and other things, and they're saying, oh, my goodness, I'm gonna give I you can't all this, control Mike. this. I may as well be in the NBA. I may as well be with the pros. I don't know. I'm going to give you all of that, and I'm still going to say that it doesn't feel right to me. I think J.J. Redick is a more reasonable choice because of the proximity to the NBA and NBA players. I think it's a tough ask to go from college. And we would talk about Billy Donovan as a wonderful guy. He's had no particular impact in the NBA yet. No particular impact. Well, here's something about J.J. Redick that I thought of. Um, If Hurley turns him down, and that's impossible. I mean, we, we saw Mike Krzyzewski turn down the Lakers 20 years ago. Coaches will, will sometimes do this. But then you turn to J.J. Redick, and you're saying to the fan base, yeah, well, eh, you know, our guy, the guy we wanted, didn't do it. So we're going we're gonna to experiment with J.J. Redick. J.J. Redick hadn't coached anybody. He hadn't won a national championship. He hadn't won one, much less two. And I think maybe he's coached like AAU or something like that. Now, not that... Not that a guy can't step off the court and coach, as you know we're seeing with Jason Kidd and the Dallas Mavericks, got them in the finals, and he's been a successful coach who made a transition right from playing to coaching, starting out with the Brooklyn Nets, and now is, uh, is back with another team that he played for in the Dallas Mavericks. And while they lost last night, you know they're in the finals, and who knows what's going to happen over the rest of the series. So there's that. But I think you're saying to the fan base, yeah, yeah we had to settle. Settle for so. It's almost like you might want to look for somebody else, like another name, because J.J. Reddick's name has been out there for weeks. And if you lose Hurley and you settle for J.J., that's not a, a good message to the fan base. Pat Forty of Sports Illustrated, often a guest with Tony, wrote a column about this yesterday, more so from the college angle of this. And I think this is really where Tony was going with his comments there. And uh, he's looking at this in a more global way in that here's the most successful coach in college, uh, has a chance to three-peat, has a chance to put himself in a category that's so rare with Krzyzewski and Wooden and, you know, Dean Smith, just a handful of others, and may pass that up to go to the NBA, and it's indicative of where things are in college sports. And he writes, for the past few years, the doomsayers have viewed various major coaching changes as a sign of the end of times in college athletics. The tumultuous state of things, namely NIL and transfer chaos, was driving great minds away 
they said. Now, you can look at some of the retirements here. Mike Krzyzewski, Nick Saban, Roy Williams, Jim Beheim, Tara Vanderveer from women's basketball. They're all older, people in their 70s. So whether the NIL and the transfer pushed them out, who knows, but they weren't going to coach that much longer anyway. Uh, Jay Wright is one that might raise some flags since he was having so much success at Villanova and left to go to TV. But he's over 60 years old. He's got a couple of national titles. So, you know, that might be understandable. These things might make more sense. Chip Kelly leaving as head coach of UCLA to become an assistant at Ohio State in football. Jeff Halfley, head coach of Boston College, takes a coordinator job in the NFL. Uh, Some point to the Jim Harbaugh situation, Mike Greenberg put those two together. He puts Hurley and Harbaugh together, and he said, look, the defending national champion in football and the defending national champion in basketball, they both lose their coaches. Harbaugh was running. You know, Harbaugh, he was suspended six games of last season, and he knew that the NCAA was going to drop the hammer on him this year. So he... In some respects, he ran to the pros. You could look at it from the angle, okay, he fulfilled one of his goals by winning a college championship. Now he's going to go back to the NFL for unfinished business where he got the 49ers to the Super Bowl and they didn't win, so now he's going to try and take the Chargers there and win. But those are not the same. Hurley was not under any investigation. This, this is. I don't think you can compare Harbaugh and Hurley. I think those are separate situations. And the reason that Harbaugh left, yeah, Money, for sure. Uh, The chance to win a championship in the NFL with a quarterback, with Justin Herbert. You know, everybody's always searching for one. Hopefully they've found one here in Jane Daniels, but we don't know. Herbert's already proved something there. So I, I don't think you tie those together and you say, oh, this is the end of college athletics. But as Forty says, it does set off some sirens here. He writes, perhaps Hurley will do what the others did, assess the situation and decide to stay put in a powerhouse job, meaning what, you know, Mike Krzyzewski did with, uh, with, the, with the Lakers turning them down and then uh, Rick Pitino uh, going back to uh, college basketball after failing with the Celtics um, and stay put in a college job. But if he leaves to follow a path littered with failure, it could be a sign of college coaching, a college coaching star who is disillusioned. The current rules and a conference landscape that continues to tilt towards consolidated football power are not Hurley-friendly dynamics. Now, remember this. Hurley's winning in a basketball conference, but the way things are changing in college athletics, it's tilting towards football. Can you continue to have this kind of success in a basketball conference? Can you come up with the NIL money to bring in these great players, or are you going to look at some of these football schools like Alabama, which has had great basketball teams, Uh, Michigan hasn't had them recently with Juwan Howard, but can certainly have them again. Uh, Even Ohio State has had teams that have uh, been to the national championship game and and, and won back in the 60s. So that's that's an important factor, too, realizing where he is. Not just that he's in college. He's in a college basketball school, not a football program. Um, And then, you know, they talk about the – they took – excuse me, Forty talks about the transfer portal. And he says, it's not like Hurley's, you know, saying I'm not going to use that because he has. Tristan Newton got him from East Carolina. Cam Spencer got him from Loyola and Rutgers. Uh, So they they played big factors in championships, and they're they're transfer guys. So he's using that. But um, as Forty writes, Hurley likely would have to fix himself some to survive in the pro ranks. He is an East Coast lifer, never having worked west of New Jersey. Isn't Buffalo west of Jersey? I don't know my geography. I thought Buffalo was. Anyway, uh, just because he's a fan of mediation and uh, meditation and scented candles, that doesn't mean he possesses SoCal Zen. And then the losing. Look, the Dallas Mavericks lost 32 games this year. Hurley said after losing a preseason scrimmage to Virginia, I was seething. That was our first real live game. Just to get beat up like that in the second half of that scrimmage was jarring because when you play bad and lose, no matter how good you are, you don't think you're ever going to win again. Well, you can't have that mindset in the pros where you're playing 82 games. And then uh, he points to the coaches who have done this, guys who have jumped from college to the pros and as, as Tony and Mike talked about there, it, uh, the record is not great. Uh, most successful, Brad Stevens took the Celtics to the Eastern Finals three times, never made it to the NBA Finals, never won a title. Billy Donovan 
uh, made the Western Finals in Oklahoma City in his first year in 2016, has not won a playoff series since, and has missed the playoffs three out of four years with the Bulls. Rick Pitino, John Calipari, John Beeline, Lon Kruger, Fred Hoiberg, Leonard Hamilton. Boy, hey, you remember Leonard Hamilton here <laughs> when they won 19 games in the, Michael Jordan's year of, uh, of being desk Jordan? Yeah, that didn't work out. Uh, Mike Montgomery, who was a successful coach at Stanford, uh, coached Golden State for a while, uh, that didn't work out. So uh, those guys all went back to college, and it just didn't work out for them. So we'll, we'll see. Um, and today could be a big day because I would think – we think the Lakers would want to move quickly, and I, I think Connecticut has to think about what they're going to do because if Hurley leaves, then you got to re-recruit all the guys who are there. And I even saw an interesting name for coach there. I don't know what his buyout would be, but Ed Cooley's name has surfaced for Connecticut if Hurley leaves. And Cooley's only been here one year at Georgetown, and it didn't go well. Not that he can't turn this around over time, but he's from that part of the country. He's a New Englander, uh, grew up in Providence, coached at Providence, might want to get closer to home, might look at the Georgetown landscape and say, yeah, this is going to take longer than I thought, and here's a ready-made program. I- I'm taking over the the back-to-back defending national champions. So a lot of things to think about there. Uh, one more uh, note on this note. Uh, uh, little little story on this. Um, just coincidentally, uh, Gino Oriema had been booked on the Dan Patrick show for yesterday, and uh, he was on to talk about Caitlin Clark because he had made some some comments about how she's being treated. I'm going to get to those uh, later in the show, but this was uh, Oriema reacting to the breaking news that Danny Hurley, because remember, this broke about between like eight and nine yesterday morning. So this was this was on the Patrick show in the morning. And and just as they were about to have the conversation, the story broke from Adrian Wojnarowski that the Lakers were pursuing Hurley. And listen to what Oriema told Dan Patrick about that. You know, this is really funny because uh, I happened to be with at a thing with him um, last night. And uh, I have no idea what's going on. You know, I have no idea where this where this is going and what's happening. But I said, just leaned over and I said, uh, hey, I think you can win a lot of championships with the Lakers, uh, you know, more so than a guy who's never coached. And um, he just looked at me and, you know, nodded and we had a good laugh. And then this morning I wake up and voila. So I don't know what's going on. And it'd be a bad day for UConn for sure if this happens. And it would be a great Great day for Dan Hurley and a, I'm sure, bittersweet day for Dan Hurley. Okay. Now, you're being serious that you did bring this up to him last night about the Lakers, John? Uh, out, of, out of nowhere, I just leaned over and I said, you know, I don't know why it came to me. I don't know why, but I said it. And, and if you ask him, he'll tell you. And I had no idea. And I woke up this morning and somebody sent it to me and I went, you got to be kidding me. I know that he's talked about not going to another college job that if he does go down the road when he thinks he's mature enough to coach in the NBA, this happened a lot quicker, but I'm wondering the state of college basketball, certainly men's college basketball, Gino, does that um, make this decision a little bit more, I guess, palatable or easier when you think about him wanting to go to coach the NBA instead of trying to go for a three-peat? All those are true. I think, um, the state of college basketball is a mess. Uh, anyone who, if anybody could manage it, though, it would be Danny because he coaches this program like it's a high school program, like he coached the St. Benedict's. Their player development program is second to none. Um, but I do think that being at UConn and given the state of college basketball and the amount of money now that it's going to take to be able to put together a national championship team every single year, I think, uh, and without knowing where it's going, it's a charade. It's this idea of student-athlete, student-athlete welfare. Every single thing that comes out of the NCAA's mouth about student-athlete welfare, mental it's bullshit. That, that, that has no factor ever anymore. And I never want to hear anybody utter those words associated with college basketball. They are, they are professional athletes just – not called that. So you might as well go coach professional athletes where it's real. Now, if Danny were to leave and somebody said to me, you know, he just took 
this NBA job, I won't name any particular city. I would say, you know, you're set up for failure, but it's the Lakers. And if I don't know the details of it, but if you're saying, hey, I want a 10 year deal, I want the same deal Brad Stevens got at Boston. It might be more than that. Well, Dan, you know what? I, hey, Andrea's wife might not like me, but <laughs> it's crazy if he doesn't take it. <laughs> but that's what surprised me, though, Gino, is he's an East Coast guy. Yeah. And and he'd yeah. have to convince her to go out, you know, to Rodeo Drive. Yeah. Well, that part she might not, she might not, <laughs> you know, she yeah. might not argue with. And maybe all the other parts she might have a problem with. Uh, uh, but yeah, yeah, it's a it's a huge family. It's a huge family decision, no question about it. Yeah, Hurley has been asked before about uh, I don't know if it was a Laker job, but uh, but going either to the NBA or leaving Connecticut or something like that. He said I have to get a divorce first. They met when they were students at Seton Hall. She's from New Jersey, uh, but you know when you're making that kind of money, you can have a place on the East Coast and you can have a place on the West Coast, and you can afford to even take private flights back and forth if you want to. So there's a lot of options there, a lot of things to think about. But how about that? Uh, Gino Oriama just happened to be sitting with Danny Hurley the night before this news breaks. He goes, hey, you know, you, you should probably coach the Lakers. And I'm, I'm thinking probably Hurley thinking to himself, oh, my God, how does he know or what does he know? Here's something else to think about. Uh, Gino Oriema uh, is 70 years old. He's just signed a five-year extension to stay at Connecticut and coach the women. This probably won't happen because of his age, but I'll bet you if he was 20 years younger, Connecticut, if they lose Hurley, might think about making Gino Oriema the men's coach. And Oriema, in this conversation with uh, with Dan Patrick, said that he had thought about some interest in the NBA some years ago to not to become a head coach, but to get in as an assistant, which would ultimately lead him to become a head coach. But he just thought he was too old at that point to do that. But, uh, yeah, all kinds of uh, intriguing possibilities if Danny Hurley leaves and we could know something by the end of the day. I mean, I, I would think it's in the best interest of Hurley to get this settled one way or another today. Either take the Laker job when he meets with uh, Jeannie Buss and, uh, and, and Rob Palenka or say to them, no, uh, I got to move on. Things move quickly. We're already starting to practice for next season. I got a bunch of guys who want to know whether they should transfer or not. We got to get this settled. So I, I would think by the end of the day, we're going to know something definitive. I think. I think. Coming up, back to the NBA Finals. What uh, what the TNT crew is saying about the effect of Porzingis last night as he came into the game and ignited the Celtics. And also, uh, more on the continuing Hurley story. Danny Hurley, is he going to wind up coaching the Lakers? We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. Well, they did call him the unicorn when he came into the NBA with the New York Knicks. A 7-3 guy who could shoot threes like that. We didn't know that this unicorn could sit on the shelf for six weeks, open the package, and he comes out flying. What Christoph Porzingis did for the Boston Celtics last night after his 38-day absence, just remarkable. And what it's going to mean for the rest of the series, we'll have to see. There's always adjustments. But uh, I don't think I can remember something like this happening before that you, know, you wonder going in, what what's he going to look like? Is he going to be in any kind of shape? Oh, he was in shape, and he was rare to go. And the Celtics uh, took a big first-half lead. The Mavericks did cut it to eight in the second half, and that would lead you to believe that they can play their way back into this series. The second game is not until Sunday night, and, uh, you know, if they win that, then everything changes. But, uh, man, for a while there, Boston looked like they were going to blow Dallas back to Texas before the first half ended. And, uh, and the big factor was Porzingis who came off the bench and gave them such life at both ends of the court. He wasn't just hitting threes and wasn't just rebounding. He was blocking shots, three huge blocks in that first half. And in the first half, when they were opening up that lead, it got up to 29 points in that in that first uh, second quarter. Um, it was because they were knocking down the threes. They shot, what, 42 threes last night and uh, shot a pretty good percentage, 38%. 
And that's what the Celtics do. They like to shoot threes, but man, uh, there was no defense uh, from Boston. And when you look at the final uh, from Dallas, and you look at the final score. Yes, Dallas was held to 89 points. But even with the first half that the Celtics had scoring 37 in the first quarter, they wound up with 107 points. So that would lead me to believe that with some adjustments, some better play from Dallas, they didn't get much of a game from Kyrie Irving last night. He was 6 of 19 from the field, 12 points. Luka Doncic did have his 30, but just one assist, one assist. Play a little better. This this could turn out to be a series. But – Uh, They have to figure out a way to deal with what looks like a fully healthy Christoph Porzingis. You know, with the the calf injury, you may remember when uh, Kevin Durant tore his Achilles and tried to play with a calf injury in the finals for Golden State, he tore that Achilles. He tore it. And you have great fear of that for Porzingis. But he didn't look like he was babying himself in any way. He had some big sprints down the court, you know, blocking some shots as it looked like Dallas was going to have layups, that kind of thing. He he really was active last night. And uh, this was the TNT crew minus Charles Barkley. I guess Barkley's got it in his contract that uh, he heads for the hills as soon as the Western Conference Finals are over with. But you had Kenny Smith and you had Shaq and you had Matt Weiner uh, anchoring the coverage along with Grant Hill. And this was their take on what they saw last night from the Boston Celtics and the lift that they got from Porzingis. Jason Tatum and and Brown are the best two players, all-star, all-NBA performers. But they don't have to be that every night. Christoph Porzingis came in 38 games, I mean 38 days, haven't been here, and was their best player. So... The most unique thing that we were talking about earlier, I said, there's not a fifth best player. At times, Porzingis could be the fifth best player. There is not one in the NBA like this guy. So, you know, uh, when I say fifth best player on the floor, White could play better in a particular night. So could Drew Holiday. And sometimes Al Horford. So this guy is an all-NBA all-star and an all-star on the verge on the cusp every year he's like he could be one of those guys on the cusp he was a unicorn in new york but more importantly i thought just as much as his scoring grant and shaq was his defensive presence which is super underrated he protects the rim you didn't see all of those lob dunks nope. that you saw in the last series because of his rim protection i think none in fact no lob dunks tonight for dallas and Porzingis came in at 717 check of the first quarter. From that point on, Boston outscored the Mavericks 51 to 31 before halftime. I'm happy for Porzingis. Uh, you know, having the opportunity to play at this level six times, that's the type of game you want. You know, it's, it's, he's had a lot of time off. I said before the game, he's either going to be great or, or going to be tired. I'm happy for him. He played well. This place was very loud. I was yes. sitting on the floor. It was going crazy. Kenny makes a great point. Defensive pre- presence. Shot the ball well. Didn't do anything in the second half, but he didn't have to. I think, you know, his presence, you know, him returning, you know, keeping the crowd in the game, they played excellent ball. But the fact that Dallas, you know, came back and cut it to eight, which, you know, still tells me that they believe. Boston put them away tonight, uh, took care of home court advantage. Game two is going to be very crucial. Hopefully, Porzingis can come out like that and play that game too. But, Listen, game one is always the fill-out game. I've seen a lot of guys have like, great game ones, and then they kind of disappear. Uh, Tatum and Brown didn't have to do anything tonight. The place was going crazy. Porzingis carried them. But I disagree with you, Kenny. I still need my superstars to play at a high level. I'm not going to rely on the others to bring me the championship. I need the others, but I'm not going to rely on the others to carry the See, load. See, I don't think... Paul like, Zingas is another. But, I think he's a he's a former All Star. I, I think he. What, what would be the next stage if you're if you're not the superstar, you're not the other. You're what is that? You are. I think you could be a star and not a superstar. He, he is a star. Yeah. He, he, is, he is a star. He is part of the big three, but he he he's been gone. Mm-hmm. The way he played tonight, if, if if he can give me two or three more games like that, yes. But you know they use him very well. He played at a high level. I'm happy for him, but. We agree like we disagree like I need my superstar to play well. When y'all beat us, Akeem still averaged 30 and you had seven threes. 
Not Akeem had 15 and you had 70. Akeem still had 30 <laughs> okay. and you had 70. So I still need my superstars right. to have right. dominant, okay. dominant performance. Well, well played. Well well played. Yes. 18 of his 20 <laughs> in the first half. And Grant, maybe as important as anything that happened here tonight is he came through it apparently unscathed and healthy. When he went for the chase down block on, I think that was Josh Green, I think there are a lot of folks thinking here, oh, don't do that. You're hitting shots. Don't don't test it that way. And he comes out the other side just fine. Yeah, he did. And, and really, when you have a lower leg injury, you've been out for 30 plus days. There's a lot of uncertainty as Shaq talked about. We didn't know what version of Porzingis we get. His offense was incredible, but defensively, the rim protection, guarding the the paint. He had three blocks in the first half, including that incredible one right there, but just really threw them off at the rim, causing turnovers. His presence defensively was just as impressive as his presence on the offensive end. And I just love, look, I agree with both of you. I, I think, first of all, your stars, particularly on the road, you know, at home, your superstars don't have to necessarily bring it. Your complimentary players can play great. Porzingis was that guy. The awareness that he was hot and continuing to feed him shows this team and how success but on the road you know Tatum and, and Brown are going to have to be big and I know we're getting ahead of ourselves games three and four but at some point they're going to have to have big moments if Boston is going to win this no, you're the only one getting ahead of yourself and, and, and <laughs> you know what I love about Porzingis today he sees the moment yes from the day he from from the time he walked in the look on his face mm -hmm. like he gave me the inclination of, man, I'm at the finals. I'm about to go to work. And he did. And the thing where they say he's a star and not a superstar, I think what's prevented Porzingis from being a superstar is the injuries. Um, he had injuries in New York, which led to the trade to Dallas. He was hurt in Dallas. He winds up here, you know, which is pretty much NBA purgatory. Uh, and then – you know, gets dealt uh, to the Boston Celtics and things start to to happen for him. But, um, you know, he again, he's coming into this off missing 38 days. I don't think anybody saw this coming. Maybe he didn't even see this coming. But he as Shaq said, he, he sees the moment and he came out and he gave them incredible life. Uh, as far as, you know, the comments that uh, I guess both Kenny Smith and uh, and Grant Hill made about the superstars performing uh, at a big, big level. Uh, they did get 38 points out of Tatum and Brown. And Doris Burke made the comment earlier in the game that she was very impressed at the way Tatum was being patient. You know, some some stars might look at Porzingis coming in the game and kind of take it over like he did and go, whoa, 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 uh, I, I, yeah, I, I get the ball. But they didn't. They, they, they fueled what the other players were doing. And you look at the numbers where you got six players in double figures, Brown and Tatum combined for 38. They got Horford with 10. Uh, he had a couple of big threes in there, uh, played almost 30 minutes, played incredibly well. And, you know, with the combination, and that's what we were talking about going into the series, that Boston had the size. So you got the two of them with Horford and Porzingis. That made a big difference. And then Holiday, Drew Holiday comes in. He's, he's a, a champion. He won a championship with Milwaukee. He knows what it's like to play on this stage. He only put up nine shots, but he scored 12 points. And so you're getting all those contributions, whereas Dallas, you got to survive a bad night for Kyrie with 12. Doncic gets you 12, but between the two, that's 42. I would think for Dallas to be dominant here, those guys got to be tickling 60. Between the two of them, they got to get 30 points apiece. Uh, Doncic did his thing, but again, one assist. And as a team, they only had nine assists and 11 turnovers. That's a bad combination. And then, you know, didn't get really any production out of anybody else. P.J. Washington gave him 14 points playing 36 minutes, and uh, and that's just, you know, not enough. They, they've got to have bigger contributions from the other guys, and the Stars have to play big. Now, to the point of what Boston Stars have to do when they get on the road, that's not going to happen until next Wednesday. And, you know, you can't necessarily say – that the series is over if the home team wins the first two games. But if it's another dominant performance by Boston in Sunday night's game two, you know, you got to wonder about that. Tim Legler was on yesterday on uh, on PTI. I watched that uh, leading into the game, and he he was asked about Porzingis, and he said, you know, while they went 9-1 without him in those 38 days that he was out, they were playing teams 
that they didn't really need them for. They were smaller teams. Dallas having more size, though, the big guys really didn't give them that much last night. Gafford played only 14 minutes. He had eight points. And then Derek Lively coming off the bench for 18 minutes. He only had two points, two points in the game. And that was in, in, in great, great, greatly due, I think, to Porzingis and the way he played. This was Legler on last night with Scott Van Pelt and, and his analysis of what he saw with Porzingis coming in the game and giving him the boost that he did. You can't put a, a measure on what Kristaps Porzingis gave them with he's, his, he's jolt, join us here, yeah. his jolt of electricity yeah. after not seeing him so long to come out, have that kind of an impact, man, what that did to that building, what it did to their team. Um, it destabilized Dallas. I don't think they were prepared for what Kristaps Porzingis presented for them and the challenge in that first half. And we wondered, would Dallas have some sort of an answer? Would they throw a combination of their own? And they did. And it gets to an eight-point game, and you said to me up in the room upstairs, you're like, well, let's see what happens now, right? You spend so much energy in the comeback, you get stops and you get makes. Is that going to happen? Is that going to sustain itself? What did Boston do when it got to that kind of frightening eight-point margin in the third to ultimately put this to bed? Luka hits the three, right? Nods a a little bit, has a little nod. And you're thinking, like, oh, Luka's feeling it right now. Like, now this is when they're a problem, one possession game. It was out of that timeout when they got back to look what their strength is, which is using penetration to create chases at the three-point line. That's really what they did to kind of close this out. Yeah, which, uh, you know, 11-0 run after uh, Dallas got it to eight, that being the difference there. As far as, the, you know, the three-point shooting, Dallas only put up 27 compared to 42 for Boston. Now, Boston is a three-point shooting team, but, you know, that's not going to be enough, especially when Lucas shoots four for 12 from three and as a team seven of 27 so maybe they hit a few more threes maybe they got a better answer for Porzingis uh they get a better game out of uh Kyrie Irving this could be a different series and I I hopefully have learned a lesson from some of the things we saw in in the early part of uh of the playoffs particularly in the Western Conference where Minnesota goes to Denver they win the first game 162 99 they hold Denver to 80 points in game two and Barkley said, that's a sweep, wrap it up, it's over. They go to Minnesota. Denver wins the next two games. Now we got a series. Denver goes home. Denver goes up 3-2. to two. Then Minnesota wins the last two, and they clobbered Denver at home at Minnesota, 115-70. to 70. But when they go back to Denver, and I thought, you know, okay, Denver's getting ready to play game seven at home. They know they got the advantage. They'll take care of business. They were closed out by Minnesota, 98-90, and, you know, maybe there was some fatigue involved and, and so forth and so on. These are two rested teams. We saw, we saw two teams come into this last night, one of them off for 10 days. Boston, after sweeping Indiana, was off for 10 days, and, uh, and Dallas had been off for a week. You know, they, they, uh, they, had, not, uh, they had not played. So, you know, uh, things can change. And while it looks like big advantage Boston – uh, I don't think that's going to necessarily be the case. All right, coming up, there's a uh, a name situation involving another professional team that may or may not relate to what's going on with the professional tackle football team here. We'll get to that and more as we continue. It's the Andy Poland Show, ESPN 630. The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. Tony's coming up at 11 o'clock. You know that in the NFL schedule this year, we're going to have a Friday night game on the first weekend of the season. It's in Brazil. It's the first time that the NFL has ever played in Brazil. It's going to be the Green Bay Packers, and the Philadelphia Eagles. The Green Bay Packers. And I say that twice because, get this, in Brazil, green is a gang color, and it sets off fireworks in the way that maybe like red does for gangs in L.A. And the NFL has got a security problem because reportedly they have told the players don't wear green. Now, I don't know if that is the uniform as well. They've got, I guess, ultimate uniforms. Both teams could wear black or one could wear black and one could wear white. But uh, apparently green is, is a real problem in Brazil. And they're talking about having the teams uh, stay in the hotel for the entire week. And when they're transported, it'll be by armored car. 
Um, I, I, I'm sure we're going to hear more about this as time goes on, but the NFL may have jumped into something a little bit dangerous there. They'll be prepared for it, but you know, in their quest to make themselves as global as possible, gobble up every last dollar, they're playing a Friday night game, regular season, which they haven't done before. You know, Friday night has been to protect high school football. Uh, they're blowing past that. And they're putting it in what could be a very dangerous area. And the two teams that they chose, the primary colors are green. The Green Bay Packers and the Philadelphia Eagles, of course, have always worn the green. So <laughs> we'll see how that pans out. And then we have this. You know that the Phoenix Coyotes have uh, thrown in the towel in Arizona. And they are moving to Utah, Salt Lake City, for next season. They're not going to be the Utah Coyotes. They have had a name the team contest, I guess, or I guess it's similar to what they've what they did here with the Commanders. <laughs> um, but what they've done is they've whittled down the list of original names, twenty names submitted in a fan survey. They said they had over five hundred thousand people submit names, and it's down to six. Here are the six: Utah Blizzard, eh. Utah Mammoth, Utah Outlaws. Utah Venom, Utah Yeti, and Utah HC Hockey Club. And here's the interesting part of this. It seems like they have the time to do it, but they're waiting. And they're not going to have a new name on the uniforms or or for the team until the 2025-26 season. So for the upcoming season, 2024-2025, they will simply be known as Utah and they will wear Utah on their jerseys, and it could stick with Utah HC. Again, I keep going back to the commanders, and and you can feel the momentum, people wanting to change the name. That could change significantly if they have a really good season. You know, if they're a playoff team, maybe even win a playoff game, if they have a, a season like Houston had last year, yeah, maybe people start to like the commanders a little bit more. But I keep going back to this, go with Washington football team. I thought it was okay for two years. It doesn't really fully replace Redskins, which in the minds of many can never be replaced, and they and they will never go back to Redskins. Don't 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 think that. But this could be a real interesting model for the team here to follow. Let's see what the reaction is. Now it's a two year process because they're going to be just Utah this upcoming season. But the following season, if they settle on Utah HC, and I think they should, and as sports look to become more and more global and mirror soccer teams who do it this way, FC, you know, that's that's how they do it. Uh, I would think that that this would become a more and more realistic possibility for Washington. And I would like to see them settle on Utah HC. Blizzard, eh. Mammoth, eh. Outlaws, Venom, Yeti. Do you want to be known as Yeti? Sounds a little too close to Yenta for me, at least for me. So, that's that's where that one is going. All right, back to uh, Caitlin Clark as she uh, makes her appearance here in the District of Columbia tonight. They had a game last season at Maryland. I think they filled the house. I think uh, now now the uh, Xfinity Center seats was it seventeen thousand something like that. They can get twenty thousand into Capital One tonight. Last night where they had Angel Reese back in town. She's from Baltimore. She wore shoes that had, like, the Maryland flag on them, spent her first year of college playing at Maryland. They limited the seating to 10,000, so they closed off, I think, the upper bowl. Tonight, I think they're going to have every seat open because tickets are selling, they say, for 300 bucks on the secondary market. There's 140 media credentials. A bunch of celebrities are going to be there, and it's, you know, it's a big, big night for, for Washington. Uh, the controversy about her continues. You know, is it right that uh, she's being knocked around by the other players? Should she be treated like this? She's the golden goose. She's the reason that these players are all able to f- fly on private flights. They don't have to go commercial anymore. The television ratings have increased monstrously. Uh, the the potential for them to really make a lot of money, which they haven't because they you know, the top salaries in the league are like $200,000. There's a lot of players making less than $100,000 in the league. And she can do that for them the way that Tiger Woods made money for golfers and the way that Wayne Gretzky increased the popularity of hockey. And they protected Gretzky. 
You know, it's a physical sport. They made sure that they didn't knock him around because he was good for business. But they haven't treated her that way as a rookie. Um, and then there's uh, this take from Gino Oriema, who was on the Dan Patrick Show yesterday. And uh, he's, he's not real happy with the way things have gone. But he also has an understanding of the way she is being treated by her fellow players, a number of whom played for him. I think you and I both know the landscape that we live in today, both um, sports-wise and non-sports-wise, right? We are in a red blue and if you're red you can't agree with blue and if you're blue you can't agree with red whereas most things are in the middle if you're a college player and you're a great college player like caitlin was the delusional fan base that follows her disrespected the wnba players by saying she's going to go in that league and tear it apart there were actually odds on what are Like, she's third or fourth in betting odds on being MVP at a WNBA. These people are so disrespectful and so unknowledgeable and so stupid that it gives women's basketball a bad name. Okay, so the kid was set up for failure right from the beginning. So if you're a WNBA player, and I believe me, I've coached the best, and I've pissed them off a lot, and they let me know about it, but they were tremendously disrespected. And none of them are going to say it. But human nature is, okay, this kid's coming into the league. And Diana said it best. This kid's in for a rude awakening. And they all jumped over her, but they didn't read the whole thing that she said. But nobody's printing. You know, Diana Taurasi was right. This kid's on the wrong team. She's got the wrong skill set to handle the physicality of that league. And she's a rookie. And if you're a WNBA player, if you're any kind of player, you're going to say, I'm going to make a statement. Targeted targeted by society, targeted by her looks, targeted by her reputation, targeted by the disrespect that they've shown to the WNBA. There's a huge target on this kid's back. I thought Cameron Brink said something really smart. She said, now they're expecting this rookie class to be perfect. This rookie class isn't even one of the best rookie classes in the last 10 years. But they've been put out to be that because the way social media is today. So what kind of impact is this rookie class having in the WNBA? How do, how do you think Clark is handling this? I think she's handling great. I think she talks a lot of and she gets a lot of back. So she deserves everything she gets because she gives it as good as she gets. it. She's just not built for the physicality of this league. Yeah, and she's not quick enough to get away from the physicality. So there's a lot of learning curve, like Diana said. And when she gets it, she has elite skills that are going to really help her. Yeah, but she needs to be on a better she needs to be on a better team and she needs to be more experienced and that will come but for these ridiculous fans who had her slotted as the next Diana now they're out of their mind and and for these people that are waiting outside the bus for the Chicago Sky team yeah. what the hell is, what do we become a third world soccer country that, that, that when a soccer player gives up their own goal in the World Cup you're waiting for him in a bar to shoot him? Like, what the hell are we doing here? Well, I think that's an exaggeration. He only had a, a, a few of the facts. What he's referring to there at the end, when the Sky showed up the other night to check into the hotel before they played last night's game, there was somebody who was was looking to confront Kennedy Carter, but not not in a violent way, and security stepped in. They didn't have to call the police, so it, it really really didn't get to the level that he's indicating it, it got to there. But, you know, men and women are, are talking about the WNBA, and they're talking about it in the way we talk about other sports. So in a way, that's been good. Um, when he says they set her up for failure, yeah, maybe so, maybe because of the hype. That, but that was going to come with the territory. There's no way that Caitlin Clark could enter the WNBA without this hype. And, yes, People are stupid. They don't know women's basketball like he does, and they you know, predict that they're going to win all those games. No, it was a bad team. The reason that, that Indiana was able to draft her is because they stunk. <laughs> they're not the worst team in the league right now. That's the Mystics. So the two worst teams are hooking up tonight, and tickets are selling on the secondary market for $300 because of her. And maybe she isn't as good as the hype, but I don't know how you could have avoided, as, as he says, setting her up for failure, but that's uh, that's the Gino take. 
you uh, have been talking about the Yankees. You know that they've won eight straight. They have the best record in baseball, 45-19. and 19. Maybe a big bump in the road as uh, they won again last night, 8-5. to five. But Juan Soto left that game in the sixth inning, has missed a game all year, and he left because of forearm tightness in his left arm. Now, that might impact his throwing, so you could possibly move him to DH, but it must be impacting his hitting as well to have taken him out of the lineup like that. Um, He said it's been bothering him for about a week and a half. He says, I've been grinding through. It's kind of funny. It doesn't hurt when I throw or hitting. It's more like soreness that I feel, any kind of move that I make with my arm, but it doesn't stop me from anything baseball-wise. I mean, he's been on a tear. He's hitting 318, 17 home runs, 53 runs batted in. The combination of Judge and Soto has been huge. Uh, And, you know, if he's going to miss significant time, not that the Yankees are necessarily going to suffer, but you want to make sure that he's back for for the stretch run and for the playoffs. So you're going to play it as safe as possible. Uh, And he's... You know, he's sitting on what could be, well, well probably won't top Otani, but it's going, to be a, it's going to be a monstrous contract when he signs it, and it's probably going to start with a five. So uh, keep an eye on that. But uh, Juan Soto checking out of last night's game with forearm soreness. Sometimes when it's a pitcher, that leads to Tommy John. I don't know if it, it, it we're anywhere near that on that. He says it doesn't bother him when he throws. It's just, it's just soreness. So maybe he's playing it safe as well, and this might be a good time to rest him as well, given that the Yankees have now opened up a a four-and-a-half game lead on the Orioles as uh, as the O's start a series in Tampa tonight. One last thing, we got the Belmont coming up tomorrow, and uh, if you haven't been following this, uh, they're doing renovations to to Belmont Park, so uh, this is going to be at Saratoga Springs, and it is shorter than the usual Belmont. The Belmont has been the longest leg of the Triple Crown, as you know, a mile and a half. This is now a mile and a quarter because of the track at Saratoga. You wonder if Mystic Dan had won the Preakness. He won the Derby. If he had won the Preakness, this would be this probably would be good for horse racing because there'd be debate. You know, is is this a true Triple Crown if if Mystic Dan is winning? Because it's not. It's not the regular distance. I know you can only run what the what the track distance is and where they put you, but um, you know where does that stand? And also, whoever wins the Belmont, I mean, is it possible? I don't I don't know if it's possible, but you know, with a, a quarter mile less, Secretariat's unbelievable mark that happened fifty one years ago, that's probably in jeopardy, right? But it's a it's a shorter distance. Uh, they've been running a mile and a half since 1927. It was shortened to a mile and an eighth in 2020, but that was because of the pandemic when everything was was you know kind of kind of mixed up there. But uh, yeah, I mean Fox's analyst Richard Migliori, who's a former jockey, says yes, it should be an asterisk for the winner because because people are going to look at the time and whether it, it passes Secretariat or not, uh, it it's going to be probably pretty close. You're running a quarter mile less. So yeah, I like I like the triple crown, and uh, it, it it's supposed to take place at six forty seven tomorrow, but these things always run late. So and it's on Fox too, which is another weird thing. I think the first two legs are run on NBC, and then Fox gets the Belmont, but uh, it still survives. It survives at a different track this year, and it's a little bit shorter. It's a mile and a quarter instead of a mile and a half. And we'll see. Uh, we'll see. But we don't have any possibility of a triple crown, which I think uh, if we had that, we have a really good controversy to sink our teeth into. But we don't have it. All right. Uh, we got the Mystics tonight. We got the Orioles tonight. Nats play tonight at home. All kinds of good stuff. We got a weekend coming up. And uh, I will be back here on Monday morning at 9 a.m. Tony is next right here on ESPN 630.